Welcome everyone. I'm Georgia Mason. I'm director of the Campbell Centre for the Study of Animal Welfare at the University of Guelph, which resides on the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Right now, I'm welcoming you from the Netherlands. <laughs> uh, we have Jane in the UK, most of you in Canada, so we're spanning quite a lot of time zones. And today, I'm really happy to welcome Jane Clements, who's a mover and shaker at a UK charity called the Cats Protection Oh, trust or league? League. Uh, just cats protection. Look, yeah. it's, it's the old yeah. name because yeah. old. You can see how long I've been a fan of this charity. <laughs> uh -huh. So cats protection, and she's um, she's presently this. She's presenting as the second in our series on the human element of animal welfare, and particularly um, how we can understand the principles of behavioural change to encourage people to uh, alter their behaviour for the benefit of animals. And she's talking to us because she leads a very successful cat watch project, which has been working with communities to um, promote and enhance the welfare of stray cats. Um, so welcome Jane. Um, sorry you have a cough. So Jane's just warning everyone she has a bit of a cough. If you have questions, there'll be time at the end to ask questions and you'll, able, you'll be able to put your camera on and ask questions verbally. Or if you're shy, just pop your questions in the chat um, as you go along. So both are good. And without further ado, Jane, welcome. Looking forward to hear what, hearing what you have to say. Thanks, Georgia. Um, and hi, everyone. Um, and thank you for joining. Um, I'll just share my screen so I can share the slides with you, hopefully. So, um, yeah, as Georgia said, um, I'm going to talk to you today um, a little bit about our community um, change work and, and how we work with communities. Um, and there's a few things I'm going to touch on. So, first of all, I'll do a little bit of a background into why human behaviour change matters um, and where we can make the greatest gains, particularly um, in this context um, of, of community work. I'll touch a little bit on theory um, and especially the theories that we've used um, in, in the development of our community work and then particularly the cat, the cat watch example. So I'll go through that um, and then um, show you a little video um, about our community work and, and that will probably tell an even richer story um, than I can um, and then give some take home thoughts um, and give you the opportunity um, to, to answer, to ask any questions, which I'll do my best um, to answer. Um, so in terms of what we mean by behaviour change, um, and what behaviour is. So somebody's behaviour is, is anything someone does in response to an event, and we know that that plays out physically, um, but, but the way that someone responds to something is, is controlled, controlled by the brain. And that's affected largely by our automatic or reflective motivation systems. And I'll touch a little bit on them um, in, in a second, but I'm sure, I'm sure many of you will, will know what I'm talking about. Um, and when we're talking about behavior change specifically, um, there's a number of there's a number of things that can enact a change. So it might be that we want people to create a new behavior. It might be that we want to change an existing behavior. It might be that we want to stop an existing behavior. Um, and in all of that, somewhere along the line, what's quite important is that we bear in mind development of new habits because um, we are creatures of habit um, and what we are used to very much determines um, how, how our behavior plays out. And why, is it, why does it matter, um, especially in animal welfare? Um, it's really important that we understand why people do what they do um, so that we can make changes for animal welfare. Um, you know, improving welfare is all about improving what people do for animals or, or, or not do for animals. If we know um, the behaviours we need to change and we understand what underpins them, um, then we can positively influence behaviour proactively so we're not always kind of working on the back foot as it were 
And ultimately, when we understand behavior and why people do what we do, what, what they do, we're able to really tackle the root causes. And once we're starting to tackle the root causes, we're making sustainable improvements um, for animal welfare in the future. So in terms of the Cat Watch project and the community work we do at Cats Protection, at the time that we started um, Cat Watch, there were 2.1 million cats not registered with a vet, um, so cats that, that never see a vet for any preventative treatment at all. Um, around 999,000 unneut unneutered cats in the UK, um, so a, a massive population of unneutered cats. An overpopulation of cats is a particular issue in urban areas of socioeconomic deprivation. And so we've got a range of cat populations all sort of working together, if you like, which causes this overpopulation problem. So where um, owned cats don't get neutered, um, that will then cause the stray cat population um, and, and, and definitely impact the numbers of unowned cats that we see in our communities. As I say, crucially, um, not only is overpopulation a particular issue in urban areas of socioeconomic deprivation, people of lower socioeconomic status are less likely to neuter. And, and that's probably kind of obvious. Um, there's less resources available to them. Um, and where human welfare um, issues are a problem, that's directly aligned with animal welfare issues too. Um, the important thing as well to remember um, when we are working um, with communities, well, with co communities or individuals, but, but generally speaking, it's important to remember that just because we tell people um, what, the, what, what we perceive the right thing to do is, um, or we give them knowledge or we generally educate, it doesn't mean that just because they know that stuff and they may well have taken it in, it doesn't mean that they're actually going to do anything about it. So there's that sort of knowledge behavior gap. Um, and that's why, why it's important that interventions that we develop for animal welfare to try and change human behavior um, helps to address that gap so that we can move people from a place of knowing what, what is perhaps the best thing to do for animal welfare to then actually doing it. We also need to bear in mind um, that as, as, as human beings, we are very much um, based on our emotions and this is generally um, what impacts our behavior. This is generally how we behave. So sometimes called fast versus slow thinking, um, sometimes um, referred to as automatic versus reflective um, motivation which is what I referred to, referred to before. So we often use the sort of um, Spock analogy, the Spock and Homer analogy, um, as creatures of habit, as creatures of emotion, uh, our go-to place um, is that hind brain. So, so we, act, we react very emotionally. Um, we don't react in that sort of logical thinking brain, um, the Spock brain, if you like. Um, so we need to bear that in mind when we develop messages, when we talk to individuals and when we talk to communities and when we develop interventions um, that we're not we can't always expect people to um, react logically um, they're going to react with with emotion and with their gut um, and so therefore um, we need to be um, check, moving people from that place of emotional feeling and emotional reaction to thinking a little bit more more logically and giving them the tools to be able to do that um, through, through the intervention and how we develop the intervention, which um, hopefully will become clear when, when I take you through the things that we've done in Catwatch. We also need to bear in mind that on top of all of that, um, behavior change is complex. There's so many different things um, that, that make up how we behave as humans. Um, and I won't go through go through that long list, but, but it's um, you know, psychological factors, social factors, um, what our external environment looks like, the resources we have available to us, um, our capability to do something or our perceived capability. Um, our past experience as well. So I think we can all probably relate to, you know, if you've had a if you've had a bad experience doing something, you're unlikely to want to do it again. Um, so we need to need to bear that in mind and make um, good experiences happen. And peer pressure is really important as well. As social animals, um, we very much um, 
rely on what our peers do we look to our peers and um, so creating interventions which mean that people have that peer-to-peer -peer support um, can be massively important as well So when we're designing interventions um, with behaviour change in mind, um, it's really important that we do a full scope, a really needs assessment of, of, of the situation, the situation ana analysis, the problem, um, and everything that, that impacts upon that problem. Um, we need to know our audience really well. So insight gathering around um, our audience, we really understand their motivations, we understand their barriers, we understand where they're coming from, um, and so therefore we can really understand what we need to do to make change. When we're designing these interventions and, and diagnosing what the problems are, we need to make sure that our objectives are specific um, and we're not trying to do too much um, or that our interventions aren't, aren't specifically addressing the objectives we want to achieve. Um, and then when we go on to implement um, our interventions, it's really important that we're open to adaptation and that we're learning all the time. And if we're going to do that, if we're going to be able to do that, we have to have an evaluation plan, ideally from the start and not after the fact, um, so that we're able to um, be iterative and adapt all the time as well. So in terms of the, the, the behaviour change models that, that we thought about and that we used when we were developing the Cat Watch initiative, um, these are the these were our sort of go to models, if you like. Um, there isn't the time today for me to sort of explain all of these in, in, in great depth, but just to touch on them. And I'm sure some of you would already be familiar with them anyway. Um, so um, we have the combi model, um, which is around looking at the a person's capability and motivation and opportunity um, in order for them to change their behavior. So all of those things will ultimately impact on somebody's ability um, to do what, what it is you're asking them to do. So going back to that audience insight, knowing exactly what the problems are um, in, in these areas means that we can develop effective um, interventions if we are taking into account those three factors. Um, COMBI also sits within um, the behaviour change wheel um, and if we look at the wider piece of the behaviour change wheel that can help us with designing interventions around what's going to work best so is it an education function that we need to put in or a training function how are we going to use enablement um, to help people do what we need them to do um, how are we going to persuade people how can we potentially change the external environment as well. Um, so it's all of those things that we can factor into our design process. We also um, looked at values modes. Um, so this um, is a sort of psychometric segmentation system, which it's much more complicated than, than this, but, but simply speaking, sort of divides people into um, three worlds of settlers, prospectors and pioneers. Um, and so people have different values depending on which group that they largely fall into. And by thinking about those um, values through surveys and things, um, we can really start to develop effective messages, which helps to and it helps to make us understand how people tick, but also means that our messages will um, resonate for them with how they tick as well, what their values are. Um, and then finally, and probably quite a really nice, easy one to think about, um, and is the one that, I, that I'm gonna probably refer to most as I, as I talk about the cat watch, um, is the EAST system um, developed by the Behavioral Insights team that used to be the old government nudge unit. Um, and that's around making sure that um, interventions are easy, they are attractive, they are social and they are timely. So by easy, we need to reduce the hassle factor. Um, we need to make sure that there's as little effort required as possible um, and, and just making messages simple as well. Um, our interventions need to be attractive so that they attract people's at attention and maybe they also factor in some design rewards. Um, I talked about the importance of peer-to-peer -peer support, so making something social. Most people perform um, behaviours based on how their peers perform that desired behaviour, um, so it's really important that, 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 that we think socially. 
um, and also that that power of, of networks and, and making commitments is really important. Um, it's important that we think timely as well. Um, so prompt people when they are most receptive um, to their immediate costs and benefits that might be available um, and that they're able to plan their response to events. And again, this will come to life, come to life a little bit, hopefully, um, when I go through, go through the cat watch um, next. So taking the cat watch specifically then as a programme, where did we start from? We started by absolutely being aware um, that there's a big stray cat problem in the UK, um, especially in urban areas, as I was saying before, but we knew that we didn't understand the full extent of that problem, probably by quite a long way. Um, we knew that we didn't understand um, necessarily the full attitudes to neutering and awareness and knowledge of neutering and the responsibility for community cats in our target areas. Um, so as I say, for us, those were the areas of lower socioeconomic status. So that was our problem. Um, and so what was it that we wanted to change? Um, and so we looked at that problem and we thought about, okay, if we're gonna, if we're gonna start to solve that problem, if we're gonna start to understand more about the stray cat population, if we're going to start to understand um, more about what people think about neutering and about cats generally, unowned cats in their communities, if we can do all of that, what will our aims be? Um, so first of all, and, and crucially, the big sort of behaviour change ask, was encouraging people to take part in the cat watch in the first place. Um, so we needed members of the public to take part and we needed them to report stray cats to us. If we did that, then we felt that that would increase our population knowledge and our awareness of neutering in those areas or how people thought about neutering as well. We could then potentially also change the way people engage with unowned cats and ultimately increase the neutering, not only of just unowned cats, but also owned cats, um, because obviously the two populations interlink um, and, and cross over hugely. So with regards to our scoping and insight, um, we needed to define the target areas and audience. Um, so to do that, um, as I say, working with areas where there was high deprivation in the UK, we looked at our indices of multiple um, deprivation, which is government um, data, um, very publicly available and fairly easy to use. Um, so we were able to target um, areas and create a list of kind of pilot areas to work with. And we knew then who our audience was, and we made sure that we um, kept it to a fairly um, small area. So we were talking about council wards. So when I say small, we were still looking at sort of an area of about 8,000 households, um, but, but small enough to be, to be achievable. We wanted our focus to be our, the attitudes to cats, what people's current behavior was, um, and the engagement and communications channels that we were using um, to enable people to take part. And we used the behavioral insight techniques and those um, behavior change models that I talked about um, to base our, um, our program on. So in terms of methodology to achieve that and, in, and and to understand where we where we were coming from and to start to develop the, the intervention we ran surveys we ran focus groups and we ran interviews so we door to door surveyed 10 percent um, of the ward 10 percent of households in, in the council ward and we asked um, people about their attitudes about what their current behaviors were towards um, owned cats, pet cats, and the unowned population. And we also asked them about the engagement and communication channels that they preferred to use. We held focus groups and the focus groups um, were primarily with um, resident groups um, and um, other agencies in the area. So um, we ran all sorts of different focus groups with um, councils, with other charities, with neighbourhood groups, that sort of thing, um, to really get an understanding 
a little bit more of an in-depth understanding of, of where the community was coming from on this issue. And then we also did some one-to-one -one interviews um, with some of the key stakeholders um, in those communities as well. So all of that um, insight, we were able to analyze all of that insight. Um, and in doing so, we were then able to develop what the Catwatch intervention was going to look like. So just to give you some highlights from those initial findings, um, we, we, we run in, in a few more wards than just Bulwell and Everton, but I, can't, I don't have time to go through all of them. So I focused on, on Bulwell and Everton. So 59% um, of people in Bulwell thought that community cats were bad for the community and 42% um, felt they were bad for the community in Everton. It, it's key to highlight here though, that when we drilled down a little bit more um, on this, over 25% felt that they were bad because they were worried about them, um, because they were worried about their welfare, they were worried that they didn't, they didn't look very well. Um, so, so that was um, kind of good in so much as there was definitely a caring attitude. It wasn't just that they felt cats were bad because they didn't like cats. 75% um, thought that the earliest the cat could become pregnant um, was six to 12 months. Um, that's still um, something that we're working hard on. Obviously, we know we can neuter a cat um, from four months and, and actually from eight weeks um, in the case of, of feral cats. Um, and most um, people in Everton actually didn't know that they, they weren't sure on, on that particular um, point. However, um, the positive was that 70% of people in Everton did know that neutering was a good way to reduce cat numbers. So we were starting from a place um, of, of some good knowledge, which was, which was positive. So in terms of, our, of the barriers um, that we were potentially looking at um, that, that, that also came out from those surveys was the social expectation. We definitely found that, that people were kind of asking, well, whose responsibility is it to some extent? Why should it be my responsibility? You know, should it be the council's responsibility? Should it be charity's responsibility? Um, and, and delving further into that, their problems were really around the convenience they had um, and the time they had available to help. Um, their own ability to trap cats, obviously it is, it is a skill um, to trap an unsocialized cat, so, so we couldn't expect people to know how to do that, and that was obviously going to come up as a barrier. Um, the cost, so sometimes people not realizing that cats protection, you know, would help, um, and, and, and that was what we were there to do. Also people um, knowing how to report a stray cat, the ability to do it, um, and, and so that, that was going to be a barrier if we didn't get that right. And in terms of motivation, um, we really needed to let people know the difference that it would make, and, and that came out as well in, in the findings that people were unsure really um, sometimes, you know, what difference would it make if the unowned cats in a community received more, more attention. Um, and were perhaps neutered to in a more um, systematic way. So um, this is how um, we designed the, the Catwatch programme in order to help people to report cats to us so that we could start to, to make a difference to these cats and get people involved with the neutering. Um, so you might wonder why there's a supermarket picture there. Um, that's the um, Tesco, the, the big supermarket in the Bulwell Council Ward. Um, really in the heart of the community, which is unusual for a big supermarket um, like that, because normally they are sort of slightly on the outskirts, um, and also um, quite a community focused store. They had a community room in that store and we used that as a hub so that people could come and physically talk to us um, and physically report cats to us and talk to us about their issues with cats. And we were there um, I think it was twice a week and it was the same time um, so that it was habitual. People knew that we could be there. Um, we also developed an app. Um, so that meant that when people were out and about, um, if they had the app on their phone, um, they could um, record a stray to us at that point. They could report a stray there and then. Um, that would mean that, that we would get that information and we'd be able to pinpoint where those cats were. And, and um, those methods really helped us create a map 
of where the cats are so that when we were start getting to the point where we were starting to involve the community in trap neuter return, um, we were able to really pinpoint where those cats were and, and do a method of systematic street by street trap neuter return. There's a um, picture there of the Crabtree Community Centre. So that was another community centre that was in Bulwell. Um, and from that centre, we also ran a reporting hub, um, but we also um, ran events from that hub as well. Um, and, and people could, again, come to an event, get to talk to us, um, and, and they, could, they could see that we were doing stuff for the community. We genuinely wanted to um, interact with the community and, and help people as well. With our messaging, um, you know, again, going back to that sort of East model, making it easy, making it simple, we needed to make sure um, that the messaging was simple and easy, but also that it appealed to our values group. Um, remember, I was talking about the, the values groups before. So with prospectors, um, we talked, the prospector group, um, I tend to be a group who um, they have very much local pride. Um, they like to follow rules, um, but they also like to be proactive. Messages always need to be simple and snappy. So we talked about it will help look after your community stray cats. It will help control, control stray cat numbers. And just, just also letting people know that it wouldn't actually take them very long. It would be really quick to do. With pioneers, pioneers tend to be more about the greater good. Um, so they're interested in wide, wider causes. Um, they'll generally get involved with anything if they can see the general good in it. So just, to, just a very, um, as you can see, a, a very minor take on words there really. So just to say to them, it would help look after stray cats in the community and, and, and all stray cats, not just, just, not just the stray cats on your street. We wanted them to know that they would be helping spread the word and they would be helping look after cats. And again, they also needed to know that actually, it, you know, this won't take long. Um, so of the, of the prospector, pioneer and settler group in both Bulwell and Everton wards, um, the prospectors and the pioneers made up the, the majority um, of, of, of those two groups in those wards. So that's why we focused, we focused on, on them. On the, on the making it social piece, we also very much realised um, that, as I said, touched on before, we, we needed to make this about being part of the community. And because in these areas we know there's so many um, but people, human welfare, welfare problems, we absolutely could not ignore that. And, and, and we needed to work with communities alongside the other issues um, that they had going, along, going on for them. Um, so on top of the reporting hubs, we also had weekly hubs where we met with people who were interested in um, coming on board with us, in helping us, becoming volunteers for us, becoming supporters for us, becoming advocates of the message, all of that good stuff. Um, and, and, and those that those hubs worked worked well in some areas better than others, um, but they certainly did make a difference. And then obviously there was also Facebook. Um, um, so we had dedicated cat watch Facebook groups in all of the areas. Again, that peer to peer thing, um, really important for all of those interventions, um, but also it, it empowered the community to look after it themselves as well, um, because the, the Facebook element definitely gave them opportunity to talk to each other um, and help each other out. And, and we saw that. And, and the social media side was, was what my master's was focused on. Uh, and that really came through how important, how important that was. In terms of making it attractive, we really wanted it to be as visual as possible as well. Um, and again, making sure that people understood how they could help. <clears throat> so you can see we used billboard messaging. Um, we also used messaging on bus stops. And we also used a bit of digital marketing, sort of low cost digital marketing um, in terms of spreading video content. <clears throat> The Stray Cats Need You message um, was very much appealing, again, to that prospector and pioneer um, 
audience and the, the, the be a superhero um, thing, um, particularly to the prospectors, um, because that they very much like to be those proactive people um, seem to be doing doing stuff for their for their community. Um, so in terms of making it um, timely, um, we needed to make sure that people could see the cost benefits as well. Um, so we made sure that people could see they can neuter their owned cat for £10. So alongside the um, unowned cat neutering we were doing, there was um, the ability to get pet, a pet cat neutered for just £10. And um, the participating local vets were doing that for us. So it was easy for people to just go along to their local vet um, and book an appointment. Um, with regards to the, the, the trap new to return side of things, it was really important that we made sure residents knew exactly what was going on. Obviously, you can't you can't see the detail in that flyer. Um, but but what we did was we um, made sure we we flyered everywhere as soon as we got to the point where we were doing trap new to return. We explained what people needed to do. We explained the timing element of it. Um, and we explained how people could help. So those were those were all really important factors um, which contributed to the, to the success of residents taking part and feeding back to us. So we ran um, the engagement. We, as I say, we got the reports in um, of the stray cats. We were able to map the cats. We were then able to do um, trap neuter return. And then we were able to um, feed back to the community. And it, it, what was really, really good to see was that um, in terms of the numbers of cats that were reported to us, and the numbers of cats that we um, were actually able to identify, but by that sort of on street work, if you like, that matched quite well. And so we, what we were able to see was that the number of cats, we actually unowned cats that we actually neutered matched with the cats we expected were out there according to the data we had collected. So we were able to feed back all of that to the community. And then afterwards, we, we did some resurveys of some groups in the community to find out their perception um, of, of where we were. So in Bullwell, those people who were aware of the Catwatch project said that they were significantly more likely to have reported unowned cats for neutering and that they felt they had an increased likelihood of doing so in the future. Um, they were also more likely to report a positive change um, in their likelihood of, of helping cats. 78% of people who had heard of Catwatch um, said that it made them feel more confident in reporting stray cats, and 75% said that their ability to help stray cats had improved due to the Bullwell Catwatch. Um, so we were pretty pleased with those results. Um, and what those results meant were that we were able to do more pilot areas and build on the Catwatch work, um, which has also helped our understanding of the unowned cat population um, in the UK. Um, in Everton, we saw increases in positive attitudes towards the support um, that unowned cats need and increases in um, positive attitudes towards neutering, uh, an actual shift of 20% in those believing that neutering reduces cat numbers as well. We asked people how important they felt it was that unowned cats were provided um, with, those, with those following items. So neutering, vet treatment, vaccinations, shelter, food, water or milk. So um, 2017 was when we did the, the, the pre-surveys, the pre-intervention work, and 2019 was when we followed that up. Um, and you can see there that there were sort of really good increases um, in all of those factors. Um, so again, really pleasing that we were able to, to change how, how people felt about the importance of all of those things um, to improve the welfare of unowned cats. 
Um, so I'm going to hand over to Quinn now, if that's okay. Um, what you're about to watch is about a 10 minute video um, and it's the community um, engagement team who are on the ground running the cat watch. Um, and they're gonna talk about what they do specific to also working with, with stakeholders in communities, specific to the deprived communities we tend to work in and also touching on the impact of the pandemic. Um, so hopefully, you, hopefully you'll find this uh, really interesting. Thanks, Quinn. Kittens like this are being found on the street on a weekly basis. This one was lucky because someone brought it to us about five days ago and one of my nurses has taken it in. But without the help of Cats Protection, working closely with veterinary surgeons in various areas, kittens like this aren't going to make it. The aim of a Cat Watch project is really to enable and empower the communities that we're working in. We hope that as a team, once we leave an area, we have left the community with the ability to manage the unowned cat population themselves. Previously working on the Bullwell Cat Watch project, which was the first of its kind, it really did show what could be achieved. A stable cat population now in the area, a community that knew what to do and who to call, and just getting waves from everyone, you know, at the vans and everybody saying hello, people just knowing who we are is, is a massive thing for us. It's really important for us to show the community we really care about what we're doing in an area, we want to help them and we want to help the cats. Research has shown that in areas of high deprivation, where human welfare is compromised, there is a knock-on effect on the animal welfare in that area. And this is our main criteria for choosing to work in an area. In the initial starts of a cat watch project, normally we don't actually work with the cats to start with. Most of that time is gathering that intelligence we need, getting to know the community, and really starting to get a feel for where we start so we can work strategically within the area. Our work with Evolve, I'm the uh, Director of Operations. We will literally do things to support the community so wherever the need is. Broxstow is an area where a lot of people are reliant on benefits but there's quite a high population of uh, young people, a significant uh, amount of old people and people living with disabilities or both. Broxstow compared to other areas of the city is quite deprived so there are high levels of unemployment um, and domestic violence as well so we do work with the police I mean get involved with different agencies to support everyone in the area. So we have a really high percentage of people that are on benefits they have to make decisions about what they spend the money on um, there's a lot of people in fuel poverty and food and pet food becomes the, the last thing that they are able to spend their money on. Doing all this research and prepping before choosing a cat watch area can take months and months. It's really important that there's a high level of need where we're going to be going and that we can have a real positive effect on the animals and the people that live there. So a family that's struggled through 10 years of austerity, cat's sort of health or cat neutering probably starts to slip down your priority list when, you, when you're working your family budget out which initially you don't put much thought into, but actually speaking to Cats Protection, you realise that that puts a huge financial burden on families that are already sort of financially deprived. It's the most financially deprived area in the city. So Cats Protection to us are invaluable in supporting our families and residents. It can be really challenging working in a new area. We need to build an awful lot of trust with the community and we don't want people to feel judged by us in any way. They need to see us as support and not a policing element. We're here to help. This community find it very difficult to trust um, statutory services, outside agencies and I think historically what's happened is people have, have come into the area to deliver projects it's been over a few weeks and then they've just gone and just left. The Cat Watch project is a very different model approach to potentially what other organisations have done before in an area. We've found the firefighter approach and sort of going in and out of an area really doesn't have that long term lasting legacy as what we're looking for within a Cat Watch project.
We started looking at ways to engage with the community. So we did start a local hub in the area and it was in a place of a local library and a local food bank. We did get quite a bit of engagement. Also as well, we joined groups in the area. So we actually attended a local knit and natter group, which was great. And it gave us an opportunity to start talking to people that live in the area. Initially, people were just wondering what we were doing and why we were there and asking loads of questions, which is exactly what we wanted, really. It really did help to sort of get that engagement going. We started to gather cat reports via the hubs, so um, by people just telling us about them. We also got them from walking around the community and just generally speaking to residents within the community. Through this, we started to pinpoint where the cats were and where the hot spots were to start, really, of, of our TNR trap, neuter and return project. By doing this and engaging with the members of the public, it soon started to you know, spread the word around and people then were asking for help with owned pet cat neutering. And this enabled us to support with transport, free cat carriers where needed and promoting our low cost neutering scheme in the area. And now we've got this cat watch scheme. I'm delighted they've landed upon Broxtow and they also seem to know what they're doing. They've got a standard format which has worked elsewhere and they know the area. I think it's going to make a tremendous difference. We were making good progress, it was going really well. We'd made those initial points of engagement with some residents within the area and they were starting to talk about us, which is always great. It's been a long time since we had the beginnings of a project again, so we're all really keen to get going. We had lots of stuff already in place. We've made some really good connections with some stakeholders in the areas. And then the COVID-19 pandemic hit. For me, during that time, it really did feel gut-wrenching, to be honest. We'd put so much work in already, and I think that was a big thing for not only myself, but the whole team as well, of not knowing really what was coming next and, and what we could or couldn't plan for. I think in the initial stages, we were thinking, OK, a short period of time hopefully wouldn't have too much of a long-term effect on the project. So all the work that we put in initially could still have that momentum as long as the time period was short enough. But as it went on and on, we slowly realised that essentially the work that we'd put in so far would have to start all over again from scratch. We worked with Cats Protection during the lockdown when we were distributing food. A lot of people were struggling and would rather buy their cat food than buy themselves food. Cats Protection came and gave us a supply of um, cat food. So in a roundabout way, by us being able to offer cat food meant that they then had the resources to buy themselves food. As we get back out into the area after the COVID-19 pandemic, we still need to find out what the impact has been on the people. Some people may be reluctant to come out to community events and some people may be reluctant to answer the door to us when we're door knocking. And we may be facing additional barriers due to the way the pandemic has affected people such as mental health, their financial situation, their job situation and things like that. It made it harder for us to work with community partners as everybody was running at a different capacity. A lot of people were working from home, so struggling to work out in the communities where that work is really important. It did reach a point where we thought, actually, we're going to have to reevaluate the community itself and what we're going to be doing in there because this pandemic could have a huge effect on every aspect of people's lives. So we're now at the point where we are having our relaunch event. It's the starting point to meet the community and know what we need to do moving forward to help that community and the cats the best we can. We've lost two years and it's so important to us that we can get the energy back up again. So finally we're here on the morning of our launch event for Broxtow. It's taken quite a few months of planning to get this together. We spent a lot of time putting out flyers and we've had a really good response from people. In a couple of hours, hopefully, we're going to get lots of people down here and be able to start talking to people about cats in their community and what we can do to help them. 
The event is now in full swing. We've got loads of residents here and everybody is engaging and visiting the tables and we've got the Zumba just about to start, so I think everybody's having a great time. We just get to know about this event from SSPC. The Zumba is very good. We also get to know about CATS and this organization, like this charity. So it's a very good event. Thank you so much for organizing this event for us. I've got some stray cats in my garden and um, I rang them up before to see what I could do to protect the cats. And a couple of months later, I got a leaflet for the door to come down to cat protection. If I do see stray cats or things what I think was wrong with cats, I'll be giving them a text or a call to let them know where they can come and find them. The conversation I had with the vet was about getting my cat neutered and to see if I can get a free cat carry out. The fact that the charity can offer me services, I feel great about that because um, it'll actually help me a lot. I tell all my friends that have got cats, if there's cats protection, that will help them get their cat neutered. And some people didn't know about cats protection and that they help neuter your, your cat. The charity is absolutely amazing and without them, I dread to think what would happen to quite a few cats that are roaming around the areas. So it's gone well, it's a bit of an understatement. I'm absolutely ecstatic to be honest. I'm absolutely chuffed that all the hard work has massively paid off. We had 142 attendees today, all enjoying the fun that we've had going off. So we've had a vet on a stall today where we've been handing out free carriers, shelters and taking surveys, which are really important. Yeah, it's given us a really good start to know how many cats are in the area, knowing that we're already helping cats as well with shelters and carriers. It's been great to see the other organisations here today as well, which have been offering loads of support to local residents. I feel this has really progressed the Cat Watch project. It really helps to get to know everyone, for them to get to know us, and we start really getting to know the cats in the area as well. Definitely got what we wanted out of it, and hopefully the local community have too. What I really hope people take away from this film is the importance of coming together as a community and really working together to make a big impact on something. Hopefully we've shown everyone what it is that we do and what we're here for and what we can help and support with. I really hope that people take away from it that Cats Protection has this whole new level to it that wouldn't necessarily be the first thing you think about when you think about cats protection and the communities that we're going to be working in these people in lower socioeconomic communities that are really struggling deserve the time that we're giving to them and deserve the support that we're providing Thank you, Quinn. Um, I'll just reshare um, the presentation to finish the presentation off. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, hopefully um, the video really, really helped to show how important um, that, that engagement with stakeholders is in the community and how you know it's it's hard to change behavior sometimes when there are um other challenges to deal with and often when we're talking about unowned cats there absolutely will be um those that those human elements those those challenges um and so it's really important that we work with those communities and we work with um those stakeholders um and so we want to be clear about the desired behavior change that we need. We need to remember it's about people. Um, we need to understand the context and the system for the audience. Um, and, and that's all about that, that sort of um, diagnosis work and, and thinking about it through a behavior change lens that I was talking about at the start. We need to make sure that our interventions are supportive, but that they're also achievable. Um, and that we change our approach and be iterative about it as we go along. Um, I wanted just to highlight um, to you all um, the next lectures coming up. Um, so on March the 22nd, um, there's a lecture on peer-to-peer -peer learning for inspiring change, um, participatory approaches, facilitation skills, and farmer-led innovation. And then um, on the 29th, um, there is um, a, a, a seminar about animal welfare research and practice in Nigeria. So just to remind you all um, about those upcoming um, seminars. 
Um, so I just want to say thank you for listening. I'm very happy to take any questions. Um, the published research on the Catwatch project um, are at those links. Um, they are open access journals, um, so, so, so they're easy, easy to access. Thank you.